This evening we're continuing our overview of the Old Testament book titled 1 Samuel. But before we examine the events found here in 1 Samuel chapter 23, we should take a moment to put our text back into its context. It'll help us to remember, first of all, that David was a man who was running for his life. And the reason why is because King Saul was trying to kill him. And in in an attempt to secure his own safety, uh, David ended up lying to a priest and he pretended to be insane before the king of Gath. And not only that, but he hid in a cave and sought refuge from his distant relatives in the land of Moab. And while David probably felt like he was all alone in all of these things, the Lord ended up surrounding him with a group of men who were in distress and in debt and discontented. These would become known as the mighty men of David. Well, it was at that point in time, uh, as the Lord surrounded him with these men, that David began to realize that he needed to seek the Lord so that he could properly lead those men. And in light of this, I'm sure that every believer here tonight has struggled with the questions that arise whenever we set out to discover the will of the Lord. I'm sure we've all found ourselves in in a time and place wondering what is God's will and and how do I hear uh, from him? How do I, how, how, how should I be led by him? Well, knowing that we've all wondered from time to time what the leading of the Lord is, I'm happy to tell you that the Lord knows how to reveal his will. He knows how to reveal his will to those who are ready to submit themselves to his almighty authority. And with this as our focus, let's turn our attention out to David's situation because we find David looking for the leading of the Lord. If you would look with me here at 1 Samuel chapter 23, we'll begin reading at verse 1. Here we learn that they told David saying, look, the Philistines are fighting against Keilah and they are robbing the threshing floors. Therefore, David inquired of the Lord, saying, Shall I go and attack these Philistines? And the Lord said to David, Go and attack the Philistines and save Keilah. Now, here in the opening verses of our text tonight, we learn about this day when the Philistines invaded the people of Keilah. And it'll help you to know that Keilah was a city within the land which was given to the tribe of Judah. And so uh, this place was inhabited by uh, the people of David's tribe. And seeing how this city was situated close to the border of the land which was being occupied by the Philistines, then Keilah probably saw uh, its fair share of Philistine raids. Uh, Now, I should remind you that the Philistines were the sworn enemies of Israel. As a matter of fact, uh, we've already seen four different battles between the Philistines and the Israelites here in 1 Samuel. But now here we are in our text tonight. We find the Philistines. They're once again invading the land of Israel. They're stealing the grain harvest from the threshing floors of Keilah's farmers. And after receiving this report, you better believe that David was ready to defend his kinsmen. He's ready to go and defend uh, those who are from the tribe of Judah living there in Keilah. And he's ready to to go and fight for the people of Keilah so that they might be saved from the Philistines. However, before just rushing forward and, and, and running ahead of the Lord, David took a moment to seek the instructions of God. As a matter of fact, look with me again there at verse two, where we learn that David inquired of the Lord saying, shall I go and attack these Philistines? Now, it'll help us to understand that the word inquired It's translated from a Hebrew word, which was used to describe someone who consults with the Lord in order to seek godly guidance and spiritual instructions. Simply put, uh, David spent some time in prayer, seeking spiritual instructions from the Lord. He wanted to know if it was the Lord's will for him to go and fight this battle or not. And it's my guess that his newfound humility, this this time that he spent seeking the will of God, it's, it's based on the fact that his own plans had resulted in the death of everyone in the priestly city of Nah. He had rushed ahead of the Lord. He had had made his own plans. And as a result, many people died. And so now here we find him humbly seeking the Lord before making a move. He doesn't want to lead his men into this battle where they all might die. Rather than relying upon his own reasoning, David spent this time in prayer so that he could lead his men with godly guidance. And there in the middle of verse two, we learn that the Lord answered his prayer by declaring, go and attack the Philistines and save Keilah. Now from this, we can see that the Lord was instructing David to go and attack the enemy. And while I can't tell you if David actually heard an audible voice or if he received this instruction just within his spirit man, uh, what I can say with all certainty is this, that God wasn't mumbling. 
Uh, God wasn't trying to communicate and somehow just couldn't. And no, David knew clearly what the Lord was telling him. He received clear instructions from the Lord. And while David was certain that he had heard from the Lord, his men uh, weren't quite sure. And yet he wasn't offended when his men presented him with some level of pushback. As a matter of fact, look with me here beginning at verse 3. Here we learn that David's men said to him, Look, we are afraid here in Judah. How much more than if we go to Keilah against the armies of the Philistines? Then David inquired of the Lord once again. And the Lord answered him and said, Arise, go down to Keilah, for I will deliver the Philistines into your hand. Now here in these verses we find David, he's responding to the concerns of his men by seeking further confirmation from the Lord. You see, these men, they, they, they weren't ready to just follow David to their death. They wanted to make sure that he had truly heard from the Lord. And so David, rather than being offended by their pushback, he simply said, okay, I'll, I'll go pray again. And in this way, we can see that David wasn't offended by those who called him into question. He, he simply saw this as yet another opportunity to simply spend more time seeking the Lord in prayer. And once again, the Lord confirmed his original instructions. Now, based on this, I would point out that those who believe that they've received instructions from the Lord, well, they shouldn't hesitate to seek further confirmation from the Lord before moving forward. And in this way, we can make sure that we've actually heard from the Lord. And in order to understand how this applies to us, if you would hold your place here in the book of 1 Samuel and turn with me to Acts chapter 13, where we find what I believe to be a New Testament example of this truth. And as you make your way to Acts 13, I want to take a moment to point out that one of the problems that we all have with hearing from the Lord or believing that we've actually heard from the Lord, well, it's based on the fact that our mind is constantly filled with thoughts that stem from the desires of our own hearts. And not only that, but our minds are also being bombarded with those fiery darts that come from the enemy of our souls as he seeks to confuse us and lie to us. Therefore, it can be difficult for us to discern the difference between the still small voice of God and all of the other thoughts that are bouncing around within our brains. Now, with this dilemma in mind, I'd like you to look with me here at Acts chapter 13. We'll begin reading at verse 1, because here Luke writes, Now, in the church that was at Antioch, there were certain prophets and teachers, Barnabas, Simeon, who was called Niger, Lucius of Cyrene, Manin, who had been brought up with Herod the Tetrarch, and Saul. As they ministered to the Lord and fasted, the Holy Spirit said, Now separate to me Barnabas and Saul for the work to which I have called them. Then, having fasted and prayed and laid hands on them, they sent them away. Now, here in these verses, we find Saul, who was, of course, later renamed Paul. He's plugged in and he's serving the Lord there at the church in Antioch. And then came the day when the Holy Spirit spoke to the leaders there at the church in Antioch and directed them to separate out Saul and Barnabas for a special mission trip. And we must not fail to notice that they didn't just receive this word and immediately react. We see that the, the Holy Spirit spoke to them and, and told them uh, his will. But then in verse 3, we see that they go, went up, they go ahead and they, they continue fasting and praying. And then after fasting and praying more, then they laid hands on Paul and Barnabas and sent them away. In this way, I believe that they were seeking further confirmation, that they were wanting to know for certain that this was, in fact, God's calling. And based on this, I would encourage every Christian to follow in the footsteps of the leaders there in Antioch, to follow in the footsteps of Saul and Barnabas by making sure that we've spent time praying and fasting and, and, and meeting with the leaders of our church so that we can move forward knowing that the instructions of the Spirit have been confirmed by other mature believers. Now, in order to further grasp the point that I'm trying to make here, I'd like to make our way back to 1 Samuel chapter 23. I want to pick up our study there at verse 5. Here we learn that David and his men went to Keilah and fought with the Philistines, struck them with a mighty blow, and took away their livestock. So David saved the inhabitants of Keilah. Now it happened when Abiathar, the son of Ahimelech, fled to David at Keilah, that he went down with an ephod in his hand. Now here in these verses we find David, he's leading his men into victory against the Philistines. And after describing the way that David saved the inhabitants of Keilah, uh, we're reminded of the fact that Abiathar, the son of the high priest, was there with David. Not only that, but Abiathar also had with him the holy ephod, which contained the Urim and the Thummim. For the sake of clarity, it'll help you to know that the Urim and the Thummim, these, these were gemstones 
which uh, were actually sewn into the ephod of the high priest, and they were used by the high priest in order to determine God's will for the nation of Israel. And you better believe that the Lord sent Abiathar to David so that David might learn how to become a godly leader who is uh, knowing uh, and, and understanding how to seek the leading of the Lord. He wanted David to learn how to lean on the godly guidance which the Lord was providing through the ministry of the high priest during this period of time. And with this in mind, I want to consider how David began to seek the Lord through the spiritual leadership of Abiathar. If you would look with me there, beginning at verse 7. Here we learn that Saul was told that David had gone to Keilah. So Saul said, God has delivered him into my hand, for he has shut himself in by entering a town that has gates and bars. Then Saul called all the people together for war to go down to Keilah to besiege David and his men. Now, let's stop right here for a moment so that we can consider the deception of King Saul. You see, King Saul truly believed that he was still uh, within the Lord's will, that he was operating under the assumption that the Lord was still leading him and, and that the Lord had given David into his hands. And while it's true that he believed that the Lord was about to deliver David into his hands, it's also true that he was completely incorrect about the leading of the Lord. The, lo the Lord was not leading him to go and attack David and his men in Keilah. Based on this, it's just important for us to understand that it's not uncommon for people to think that they're following the leading of the Lord, but the fact is they're just following after the des the, their own desires. And, and, and what they fail to recognize is that their own desires aren't automatically in line with the leading of the Lord. There are many like Saul who are just following the desires of their own hearts, but they think that they're following the leading of the Lord. Knowing that that's the case, I believe David realized the importance of seeking further confirmation from the high priest of God. As a matter of fact, look with me here beginning at verse 9. Here we read, when David knew that Saul plotted evil against him, he said to Abiathar the priest, bring the ephod here. Then David said, O Lord God of Israel, your servant has certainly heard that Saul seeks to come to Keilah to destroy the city for my sake. Will the men of Keilah deliver me into his hand? Will Saul come down as your servant has heard? O Lord God of Israel, I pray, tell your servant. And the Lord said, he will come down. Then David said, will the men of Keilah deliver me and my men into the hand of Saul? And the Lord said, they will deliver you. Now here in these verses we find David, he's seeking the Lord by asking the high priest Abiathar to seek the will of God by the use of the ephod of God. And, and in other words, uh, he was asking him to use the Urim and the Thummim to, to seek out what God's answers were. And as we consider the Lord's response here, we're presented with a pretty good picture of a paradox that arises whenever we attempt to understand the balance between God's sovereign foreknowledge and our free will responsibility to make good decisions. In order to explain what I'm saying by this, I want to take a moment to consider God's foreknowledge here in these verses, because as we've seen here, God already knew that if David remained in Keilah, then Saul would come down and attack the city. Not only that, but we also see that God knew that the people of Keilah would hand David over in order to spare their city from certain destruction. These are things that God already knew would happen. And in light of this, we can see then that God foreknew the outcome of David's decision to remain in Keilah. At the same time, though, it's also important for us to understand that the foreknowledge of God does not rob us of our free will. But just because God foreknows something doesn't mean that we've been forced to make those decisions. And with this in mind, if you would look with me there, picking up at verse 13, because here we learn that David and his men, about 600, arose and departed from Keilah and went wherever they could go. Then it was told Saul that David had escaped from Keilah, so he halted the expedition. Now, wait a minute. I thought God said that Saul was coming to Keilah and that David was going to be handed over. What, what gives here? Well, I believe that we find David here responding to the foreknowledge of God by choosing to avoid the outcome that the Lord had revealed. And knowing that his decision to remain there would result in the destruction of Keilah as well as the capture of his own men, David and his men decided to depart from this area. And then after hearing about David's departure, Saul decided, well, there's no point in going to Keilah then. Now, there are some who take this story as evidence that God doesn't know what's going to happen tomorrow. 
Rather, they believe in a God who, who, who is learning about tomorrow just like we're learning about tomorrow. They, they don't believe in a God who knows the end from the beginning, but rather they've embraced this doctrine, which is known as open theism, which presents us with a God who's just as surprised by tomorrow as we are. Those who embrace this belief, well, I would simply remind them of the fact that the Bible is filled with prophecies which have accurately presented the future in advance over and over and over again. According to one person's calculation, the Bible is almost one-third prophecy. And the God of the Bible who's the one, uh, is the one who insists that the proof of his deity and the proof of his sovereignty will be seen in the fulfillment of of biblical prophecy. Would that being the case, uh, the, the concept of open theism that tomorrow is a surprise to God, it, to me it's just ludicrous. And with that being the case, we should take a moment to ask then, why did the Lord tell David that Saul was going to capture him in Keilah if he already knew that David wasn't going to be there and that Saul wasn't going to capture him? Well, in order to answer this question, it's important for us to understand that David's question, the, the question that David presented the Lord, was centered around the outcome of his decision to remain in Keilah. David was asking, hey, if I stay here, is Saul going to capture me? Are the people going to hand me over? And to that question, the answer is yes. If you remain here, then Saul's going to capture you. Therefore, the Lord was correct when he told David that Saul would capture him there in Keilah. At the same time, David could have asked another question. He could have asked, if I leave Keilah, will Saul capture me? The answer to that would have been no. He won't capture you if you leave Keilah. Both are true. David had the free will to choose. And in light of all this, it's important for us to realize that the Lord has given us free will. Now, granted, it's free will within perimeters. Uh, we can't just go outside and decide to flap our arms and start flying, right? Uh, that's not within the perimeters of our free will. But within the perimeters that God has given to us, we have freedom of choice. And while it's true that the Lord is ready to provide us with the information that we need so that we can make good and godly decisions, we have to remember it's still up to us to make those godly decisions which keep us under the umbrella of his sovereign protection. With this in mind, let's continue to consider the way in which the Lord helped David to escape the sinful plans of Saul. And if you would, let's pick up there at verse 14, where we learn that David stayed in strongholds in the wilderness and remained in the mountains in the wilderness of Ziph. Saul sought him every day, but God did not deliver him into his hands. Here in this verse, we find the Lord continuing to deliver David from the sinful plans of Saul. And it'll help us to understand that the word deliver here, well, it refers to the act of handing something or even someone over into the hand of a recipient, kind of like when the mailman delivers the mail to your house, right? He, he delivers that mail into your box or into your hands so that you can receive it. But in this context, we see that the Lord wasn't delivering David into the hands of Saul. Or we could think about it like this. The Lord was delivering David out of the hands of Saul. He was keeping Saul from capturing David. And from this, we should consider how this divine deliverance well, it was actually based on a prophetic promise that the Lord had made to David. And with this as our focus, let's consider the way that Jonathan showed up to encourage David by reminding him about this promise. If you would look with me there, picking up at verse 15, here we learn that David saw that Saul had come out to seek his life, and David was in the wilderness of Ziph in a forest. Then Jonathan, Saul's son, arose and went to David in the woods and strengthened his hand in God. And he said to him, Do not fear, for the hand of Saul my father shall not find you. You shall be king over Israel, and I shall be next to you. Even my father Saul knows that. So the two of them made a covenant before the Lord, and David stayed in the woods, and Jonathan went to his own house. Now, as we consider these verses, we should take a moment to place ourselves in the shoes of David. I want to remind you that David was a young adult who simply set out to serve the Lord and his king and his country. For example, he was the one who showed up and fought and even defeated that giant named Goliath. He put his own life on the line so that he could save Israel 
from the captivity of the Philistines. Not only that, but he's the one who came along and played the harp for King Saul when Saul was suffering from the distressing spirit. Furthermore, he also served in the military and he, and he led the troops into many victories. But, but rather than being rewarded for all of these efforts, David's country had turned their back on him. His king was trying to capture him and kill him. Therefore, he found himself hiding in the wilderness of Ziph. Some reward for uh, you know, a national hero, even a national treasure, if you will. That being the case, I can only imagine that David was completely discouraged by these circumstances. He set out to serve his king and his country. He set out to, to serve the Lord. And now he's having to hide in the wilderness because he, he had been successful. Thankfully for him, the Lord sent Jonathan to strengthen David's soul there in the wilderness of Ziph. And it was during this emotional reunion when Jonathan strengthened David's hand in God. And he did this by reminding David about the Lord's prophetic promise that he would be king. With this in mind, look with me again there at verse 17 where Jonathan said to David, do not fear for the hand of Saul, my father, shall not find you. You shall be king over Israel and I shall be next to you. Even my father, Saul, knows that. Here in this verse, we find Jonathan helping David to patiently wait upon the timing of the Lord. And that can be so hard for those of us who want to know God's will. And we think we know God's will, but it's not happening right now. And it's, it's just difficult to wait. And yet, I would encourage you today to patiently wait upon the Lord. That's what Jonathan was helping David to do, to patiently wait upon the timing of the Lord. And he does this by reminding him about the Lord's prophetic plan to make David the next king of Israel. And as we consider the way that Jonathan was strengthening David's spirit here, I want to take a moment to consider how this applies to us. And, and the reason why is because it's possible that you're a believer who is completely discouraged by your current situation. And maybe the Lord has revealed his will to you. Maybe the Lord has, has, has given you some insight into what he wants to do through you. And yet it just feels like you're hanging out in the the wilderness of Ziph waiting for things to happen. You might feel discouraged as a result. You might feel like David on that day when he was there in the wilderness. And rather than living in the victory of the Lord, you're struggling to understand what God's will is for your life or why it's taking so long. If this sounds like you, then I would remind you of the promise that the Lord revealed in Revelation chapter one, because there we learn that the Lord Jesus has washed the born again believer of our sins, which is great news to remember. But not only that, he also promises us there in Revelation 1 that he's going to transform our lives so that we can become the kings and the priests of God the Father. That's his ultimate goal for us. Now, there's many things that will happen in between now and then, but ultimately, it's his plan to turn us into the kings and the priests of the Most High God. And that's going to happen for the born-again believer. Without debate, this should be a source of great encouragement for every single one of us. And yet, I should also point out that this transformation that takes place, well, it happens through the daily trials that we're facing each and every day. With this in mind, if you would look with me there beginning at verse 19, because here we learn that the Ziphites came up to Saul at Gibeah saying, is David not hiding with us in strongholds in the woods in the hill of Hakilah, which is on the south of Jeshimon? Now, therefore, O king, come down according to all the desire of your soul to come down, and our part shall be to deliver him into the king's hand. And Saul said, Blessed are you of the Lord, for you have compassion on me. Please go and find out for sure and see the place where his hideout is and who has seen him there. For I am told he is very crafty. See, therefore, and take knowledge of all the lurking places where he hides and come back to me with certainty and I will go with you. And it shall be, if he is in the land, that I will search for him throughout all the clans of Judah. Now here in these verses, we find the people of Ziph, they're revealing David's location to King Saul. And though the Ziphites were from the same tribe as David, they still had no problem informing Saul about his hiding place, which was located in the wooded area around the hill of Hakilah. Now, the word Hakila here was translated from a Hebrew word which simply means dark. 
And if you've ever been hiking in this heavily wooded uh, area or a, a heavily wooded forest like Hakila, uh, then you know how quickly a tree canopy can create darkness even in the middle of the day. A thick tree canopy can block out the light of the sun. And with that being the case, this was actually a great place for David and his men to hide had it not been for the loose lips of those Ziphites. Knowing that he had been betrayed by men who had come from his own tribe, I believe that the darkness of Aquila probably took on an entirely new meaning. I believe this, this became a, a dark, depressing place knowing that he had been sold out to the highest bidder even the men from his own tribe. If you've ever been betrayed by another believer, then you can understand the dark depression that I'm talking about. Maybe you shared sensitive information with someone that you thought would, would just hold on to that information and yet they went and, and shared it with the gossip mill. Or, or maybe somebody made promises to you even here in the church and they broke those promises and you found yourself at the hill of Hakila in a very dark place. Thankfully, David knew that this dark place was just another opportunity to seek the leading of the Lord. And with this is our focus, I want you to hold your place here in 1 Samuel and turn with me to the 54th Psalm. You see, it's in Psalms 54 where we find David. He's crying out to the Lord after discovering that his own kinsmen, his own tribesmen, had given away his coordinates to King Saul. And as we consider uh, the darkness that he was experiencing at that point in time, it amazes me uh, the lyrics of this song of praise that David began to sing about the goodness of God. And as we consider this song of praise, we must not fail to notice the great faith of David as he sought the deliverance that comes from the leading of the Lord. With this in mind, if you would look with me there at Psalms 54, We'll begin reading at verse 1 because here we learn that this psalm is actually a contemplation of David when the Ziphites went and said to Saul, is David not hiding with us? Save me, O God, by your name and vindicate me by your strength. Hear my prayer, O God. Give ear to the words of my mouth for strangers have risen up against me and oppressors have sought after my life. They have not set God before them, Selah. Behold, God is my helper. The Lord is with those who uphold my life. He will repay my enemies for their evil. Cut them off in your truth. I will freely sacrifice to you. I will praise your name, O Lord, for it is good. For he has delivered me out of all trouble, and my eye has seen its desire upon my enemies. Now here in this psalm, we find David praising the Lord for all of the ways that he had already helped him to escape the hand of Saul. And as he considered the way in which the Lord had already helped him, he, he was convinced that the Lord would continue to deliver him out of every trouble. And I would give you that same word of encouragement. Just look back at all the times in your past that the Lord has bailed you out or helped you out in a time of great distress. I know that I can say today, he has never failed me. He has never once failed me. And so as I look forward at, at, at troubles and trials in my future, I look back at the past and say, well, he's never failed me in the past. So I know he's not going to fail me in the future. He's going to save those who trust in him from every trouble. And, and listen, when David says that, that he was saved from every trouble, that's not to suggest that David was free from troubles. And we don't want to get that confused. David wasn't free from troubles. No, instead, he was simply praised in the Lord because the Lord was protecting him through the troubles and the trials. He was protecting David from falling into the hands of those who wanted to keep him from becoming the next king of Israel. Therefore, David was convinced that the Lord would continue to deliver him from the desires of his enemies. With this as our focus, I'd like now to turn back to 1 Samuel chapter 23, where we find the Lord delivering David once again from the hand of King Saul. As a matter of fact, if you would look with me, we'll pick up our study at verse 24. Here we learn that they arose and went to Ziph before Saul. But David and his men were in the wilderness of Maon, in the plain on the south of Jeshimon. When Saul and his men went to seek him, they told David. Therefore he went down to the rock and stayed in the wilderness of Maon. And when Saul heard that he pursued David, he pursued David in the wilderness of Maon, then Saul went on one side of the mountain, and David and his men on the other side of the mountain. So David made haste to get away from Saul, for Saul and his men were encircling David and his men to take them. But a messenger came to Saul saying, hurry and come for the Philistines have invaded the land. 
Therefore Saul returned from pursuing David and went against the Philistines. So they called that place the Rock of Escape. Then David went up from there and dwelt in strongholds at En Gedi. Now here in the final verses of our text tonight, we learn that there were a, a few from Ziph who were still on David's side. And so they went and warned him that Saul was on the way and, and, and they wanted to help David and his men escape. And, and when Saul and his men finally arrived there in Ziph, David had already moved his men southward to the wilderness of Maon. It wasn't too far away, but it was far enough to put some distance between the two of them. And it's important to understand that the word Maon was translated from a root word, which refers to a shelter of refuge. They had fled to a shelter of refuge. And from this, we can see how the Lord was actually answering David's prayer for protection, which we saw back in the book of Psalms. It was there in Psalm 54 where we find David crying out for that protection. And now we see how the Lord answered that prayer. He led them to a safe place where they could find a shelter of refuge. And it was there where the Lord protected them from Saul by guarding them with the rock of escape. I love that. The rock of escape. This, of course, is an Old Testament picture of our Savior Jesus, who is our rock of escape. He is our rock of salvation. In the 31st Psalm, it's verses 1 through 3, where we find David, he's singing another song of praise about our Savior, who is our rock of refuge. In Psalm 31, verse 1, David declares, In you, O Lord, I put my trust. Let me never be ashamed. Deliver me in your righteousness. Bow down your ear to me. Deliver me speedily. Be my rock of refuge, a fortress of defense to save me. For you are my rock and my fortress. Therefore, for your name's sake, lead me and guide me. I love that. He's crying out to the rock of refuge and the rock and, and the fortress of his defense. And he's saying, lead me and guide me into your will. And based on this Psalm, we can see that our promised Messiah, who is the rock of our refuge, he's the one who can lead us and guide us into the will of God. The rock of refuge who is Jesus Christ will lead us and guide us if we would simply spend time seeking the godly guidance of our good shepherd, Jesus. That being the case, I want to conclude our study tonight by assuring you of the fact that the Lord is the creator of communication. And sometimes we kind of think of God as this, this being who, who has a hard time talking to us. Uh, listen, God created communication. I don't think he's confused by it. I don't think he has a hard time like, you know, how do I speak to these people? And No, he's not confused about communication. He created it. He has no problem revealing his will to those who are ready to submit themselves to his authority. Therefore, the only breakdown in our communication with God, it occurs on our end, not his. If there's a breakdown in communication between you and God, the difficulty is on our end. It's for this reason that the Lord Jesus continually said to the people, Who, whoever has an ear to hear, let him hear. In other words, if you have ears, listen up. If you go back and you look through the, the seven letters to the seven churches in the book of Revelation, each one of them ends with Jesus declaring, he who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. And in this, we see that so many of us, we all have ears, and yet how often do we, do we fail to use our spiritual ears to listen to what the Lord is actually saying? Christian, listen. The Lord is going to lead us, and he's going to guide us into his will if we have ears that are willing to hear. If we will open up our spiritual ears and really seek the Lord and what he's saying with an obedient heart, He's going to reveal his will to us. Therefore, it's our job to just make sure that we have those spiritual, teachable ears which are ready to hear. We need to make sure that we're tuned in and ready to receive everything the Spirit of God would say to us. And therefore, if we're struggling to hear the leading of the Lord tonight, I would just encourage you to spend some time asking the Lord to help you to open up those ears. Let's ask God to give us those ears that can hear. And with that, what I also mean to say is a heart that can receive 
as well as feet which are ready to obey. And it's in this way that I believe the Lord will clearly give us the instructions of his will. He will lead us and guide us. And all along that path that he leads us on, he will be our rock of refuge.